The Waterloo Region has a rich history of innovation, problem solving, and community building. We know that when the potential, skills, and talents of everyone in our community are fully realized, our whole region grows stronger and more vibrant, socially and economically. But like many communities the world over, we face a barrier to unlocking this potential, a power imbalance stemming from a lack of equity. The members of the Wellbeing Waterloo Region know that when we put our hearts, minds, and actions to it, we can construct a breakthrough, a way to reset these imbalances to create the vital conditions for optimal development for all, not just a few. Together, we began this process in 2019. We've created this tool to help you build your capacity and extend your learning to your organizations, colleagues, friends, and family. A single frame of a film by itself is just one image. But together, with other frames, it has the potential to become much more. A story that influences hearts, changes minds, and inspires feet to action. Most groups are quite nervous to talk about this issue and I think that's a learned response. Um, <clears throat> I think it's very, I think it's contextual to this space, this country, um, this part of the world where uh, there are a lot of diverse bodies around but we've been taught that it's impolite and maybe even mean, <laughs> you know, to to talk about people's difference. And because of what people have been taught about this subject matter, people find it upsetting. I think that anything that is new, that challenges the way that we have seen the world or ourselves in the world, our role in the world, or that challenges our own narrative about why we have the things that we have, whether we've earned those things or, you know, or we've been given some kind of advantage in relation to our peers. Those things make people uncomfortable. At the core of neoliberalism is meritocracy and this idea that what we have, we have because we work for it. And that's a really critical and important idea in Canadian society. And so when we talk about the origins of our issues today, so the origins of sexism and racism and classism and ableism, etc., and we talk about the big ideas, the legacy occurrences that are at the root of those, people become very uncomfortable right off the top. But I believe that it is in that discomfort that the learning occurs. We have to be able to break through the ideas that we've had about ourselves, about others, about how society is set up in order to open ourselves to the conversation we need to have. And so discomfort should be welcomed. I always tell people when I'm doing trainings that, you know, safety, safety I'm, I'm striving for, but your comfort is not on the menu. What's so interesting about the body is that it doesn't know the difference between a physical threat and a theoretical threat. What people are experiencing is a reaction from their amygdala, a reaction to what they're hearing and a sensation of threat. So it is so important when we enter into this conversation to be conscious of this. So a deep breaths, you know, thinking happier thoughts and just sort of stopping the train of thought to get ahead of it. The idea of practice over perfection, I have found really, really helpful. Uh, and so it's, it really is speaking to what posture we have and how do we sort of carry ourselves as we enter into this conversation. And so think of an organization where something oppressive happens. You know, the very common response by the organization as a whole and often by individuals therein is, I couldn't have done that. Do you know who I am? You know, it's do you know who my brother is? Do you know who my, my partner is, my grandchildren, right? People start to tell you all the reasons why they couldn't possibly have been involved in, you know, in what's being asserted. And 
That posture has, has really resulted in shutting down the conversation that we need to have, frankly. But what would happen if we saw ourselves as being in practice? If we saw ourselves as being not perfect in relation to this work, but in practice in relation to this work. If we think we've arrived, we're not open to hearing um, what people have to tell us about how we're, you know, how we're impacting people. But if we understand ourselves to be in practice, then we remain open to all the ways that we can be redirected and supported to be better and to impact people more positively. What's been interesting about the way this conversation has been taken up is that we have fallen into good, bad binary. People are good if they are not racist, not homophobic, not sexist, and they are bad if they are those things. And I think that the truth of the matter is that if we are to use binary such as good and bad, uh, then we need to understand that good people can indeed be oppressive um, because there is a big difference between intention and impact. Oftentimes people don't necessarily know they're being oppressive, but the impact is as such. And so we need to be able to break through the good bad binary in order to have the conversation, in order to get to the heart of, of the issues and the root of the matter. So if we normalize and understand that oppression is around us, it's most often occurring systemically. And, and part of the thing about the systemic nature is that it's invisible to us. Even to those who are being impacted by oppression, it is invisible. The operation of it is invisible. They feel the impact, but oftentimes when people are being oppressed, they don't always know all the, all the ways that um, the system is operating to create those oppressive outcomes. And so, if we first start with the notion that systemic oppression is real, it is happening all around us. I think that what that does right off the top is it allows people to lean into the conversation. We are implicated personally, and there are ways that we need to take responsibility um, and, and take account and um, you know, be held accountable, et cetera. But we're also talking about a larger project that's afoot. So what we need to be conscious about is how is it operating? Who is it impacting? Who is it benefiting? What's my role in disrupting that? Have I played that role or have I played a role that in fact makes the experiences for those who are targeted by oppression worse? I've spent the last 20 years um, visiting all kinds of organizations um, in, in a number of sectors. I haven't ever visited a space that said, we're not concerned about marginalized people. It's nothing to do here, right? Every single organization I've ever visited expressed concern about marginalized people, expressed interest in doing something, their part, to address the experience of marginalized people. And that's been great. You know, that's a great place to start. What then happens, typically, is they proceed to share with me the diversity committee, the flags that they have that represent diverse groups. And they'll tell me about the multi culti potluck every third Thursday of the month, right? And all of that is great. And I wouldn't suggest that any organization stop any of those things. But when I ask then, what difference has all of this made? What outcomes have you seen that are different? And most, in most cases, organizations don't have that to report. And so, it has, it has occurred to me that one of the issues is that we have collectively kind of gone along a path of this work, but haven't stopped to really be clear about why we're doing the work. So you will hear organizations talk about diversity, inclusion, anti-racism and anti-oppression if they're critical, uh, and, all of, and all of these sorts of things, cultural competence, et cetera. But to what end? To what end anti-oppression? What should the organization look like as a result of having been committed for years to diversity and inclusion, to anti-racism and anti-oppression? What should be different? And you know, it is through a, an equity approach that we can ask those questions and answer those questions.